high engineering is not so serious that you need exactly the same result every time. I like making things that don't take too long. I like to use materials that don't cost an awful lot. I like to get a bit of fun out of things. All the movements start as rotary movements, turning round movements, and there are various systems for, for deriving sliding movements or swiveling movements or corkscrewing movements, and you just have to fiddle around until you get them. In CDT, you're designing and making things that have to do a job, that have to work, and anything that works that has moving parts in it will involve using mechanisms. In Paul's toys, there's a range of mechanisms from very simple levers that just sort of push things up and down to the parts that make the levers move. You use cams and cranks, gears. I know he uses sort of chains and pulleys as well. These are the contraptions I make out of bits of wood and wire. And what I try to do is to find the simplest way possible of producing from a rotary movement like that, which comes from a handle or sometimes from an electric motor, some kind of approximation of human movements in the little figures that I make. There you can see this little hand stirring the cup of tea. This hand, in fact, is limp and doing nothing. The spoon is stirring in the cup without any uh, help from the hand. And that's the easy way around to do it, and that's my approach. Why did you choose to have someone sitting down? Well, sitting down is a lot, e it's a lot easier to make a model of somebody sitting down than somebody walking around. So on this one, the head just sort of looks down, but I suppose mm. when someone's eating, I yes. suppose we'd have to try and make the mouth open and shut, wouldn't we? We'd have to think of making a hole in the front of the face, yes, somehow. And that way, well, I would imagine you'd do that with a lever or a push rod. You could push up and open the mouth like that. Uh, I could do a... I could, for instance, draw a head like that face on the front and a jaw and a neck and teeth and that's where it opens and the important thing is the pivot point there and on the skull there's a pivot point there uh -huh. so that we're going to move this open and shut like that uh -huh. I guess I can see that but we could I suppose keep the jaw still and exactly. move the skull yes. round if that were a fixed point there and you pulled that down there you get the same effect. Your mouth would open like that. Put a nose on. And the best thing would be to try one, make one, and yes, see make how a it small performs. model to see how it performs. Yeah. It's much better to think about the mechanism using very easy to work materials like cardboard, lollipop sticks, which you can shape easily, and then get a mechanism which works from that before you go on to do it in a much more difficult material. I've sawn the profile of it out, and then I've cut out this jaw shape here. And I've split the jaw into two pieces, drilled holes through, and I've pivoted that bit there. And this bit here, which I can push the pin into, I hope, like this. So that that works when you twiddle it. And I've also made a little nose, I think, which we'll put on there. And I've started to chip away bits from the square bit so that it produces a round head. And then we're going to have to get a body which we'll make out of this lump of wood here with a groove in it that the neck parts fit into like that. And there it is. We've stuck it into the body and screwed the jaw part down and left this part so it slides up and down inside the groove. And then I can take a, a piece of wire with a crook in it and connect that so that that part, when it's in, can descend into the machinery to be pushed by whatever arrangement of wires and levers we have down there. If I want to make the mouth open, I'm going to have to put a cam on it. And on the circle part, nothing much happens to the mouth. But when we get to the lump, the cam pushes this up, which pulls that end down, and that makes the mouth open. If we want to get a sudden snapping movement, then we've got to put in a slightly different shaped uh, cam, 
which is this one. And you can see that lever should suddenly drop down when it reaches that point and cause the mouth to snap shut. So. What we do next is we make a table and we have a bowl for the food to go in. And the food that we're going to use is spaghetti because spaghetti tends to follow the path of the, of the spoon or fork that you're going to be delivering it with. And that means if we make rigid spaghetti, we don't have to worry about all the muscular movements of the arm. The spaghetti will push the arm into place. So that all we have to do is find a way of manipulating the spaghetti from underneath so it forces the arm and the fork towards the mouth. And that requires a bit of geometry, drawing, we have to start with a fixed point on the table, which is the hole in the plate through which the spaghetti travels. And that's the surface of the table, say there, as our fixed point. The spaghetti has to come up and then around the jaw. There's the jaw there. Here's the man's head. Here's his nose. And in order to get this sort of curve, we can have an extra little arm from there and the path of this arm swiveling around that point there will produce a curve a bit like that so what we have to do really is to when we've got the the two parts made we can then move this in and out so that this final point of that coincides with the jaw and this lever will be, this lever that controls that will be fixed between the legs of the table if it's planned out carefully. The problem is to decide on the length of that lever and where to pivot it. If I try this out with a very small uh, lever here, the, real, the problem is that the spaghetti moves across quite nicely to the mouth, but it never gets down all that far towards the plate. So that lever just wouldn't be any good. I'm going to need to go much, much, much further out along here and use this one, I think. Oh, yes, now I can get my spaghetti right down onto the plate as I move up. Yes, I think I can get my spaghetti to move across towards the mouth. There's two ways we could drive that mechanism. We could either use a cam like Paul has done in the past, just to push this up and down. Or we could use a crank. I think it's worth looking at the way a crank works. This is a, a simple model of a crank. And as we turn it round, it produces backwards and forwards movement here. And the important thing about the crank is this distance between here and here. Now, depending on how far you want the movement here, you have to adjust this distance on the crank, and that's usually called the throw of the crank. Now we've got the cranking movement working to produce this spaghetti upwards surge. We're going to have to add the piece of machinery that makes the jaw work. I've bent that lever round there at the bottom, so we're going to have to have a lever to waggle that, driven by a cam on here. I'll take this bit apart. And add the cam, which isn't a circle and isn't an egg shape. It's just a shape with a bump on it. The best thing to do is put it in and see what happens. And we need a lever to connect the bump on that to this part. And that's this piece, which has to go there. But we can't really test it until that's glued and firm. It appears that the spaghetti isn't meeting an open mouth, it's meeting a nose. And what we have to do is turn the shaft so that the mouth will be open when the spaghetti's at the high point. And that's nearly right. I think we can get on now with making the hands and all the fancy bits. Because the machine is now, as a machine, it's okay, it works, it's finished.
Perhaps, Paul, you could run us through some of the points which were particularly tricky to get right. Yes, I think the trickiest thing that you ever have to make is a, is a crank. So what I did when I made it was to make the crank and then adjust everything else to fit with the crank. Secondly, the connecting rod. If I were a bit wiser doing this, I think I'd have made a connecting rod that you could extend and contract to adjust. That's the one we did. This point here, where the connecting rod joins with this lever, I've had a few shots at that, so possibly a, an adjustable bit there would have been a smart idea. They're the, they're the most awkward bits of the thing. Another thing that's different today, Paul, is the chewing motion. Once the spaghetti's in his mouth, he then has a sort of little nibble as the, as the fork goes down. Um, he wasn't doing that yesterday. No, I, I cut a bit of the smoothness out of the movement of that by slicing a bit off the top of that cam so that there's a slight wiggle to the motion of the push rod here and it gives a little chewing slightly just makes it a little bit more interesting one of the things that's very different this time paul is the the finish because he no longer looks like a, a wooden man he looks like a real person now the thing to do is to look around and find stuff that looks right and try it out and stick it down this the spaghetti you see is uh, is silk embroidery thread and it hangs just about right not perfect but near enough this is a piece of wood that's been hacked carved and uh, those lines on it are done with a colored pencil and this is a part of the paper bag i got the paint in so it's all it's all easy stuff really. all materials that really come to hand mm -hmm. yeah yes i think that's one of the the points to make about this is that nowhere are we using very expensive or rare material no, at all no the only thing that's the only thing I've used that's a bit out of the ordinary is the lime wood for the head and the hands because simply because it's easy to handle. If you were carving something finely like that, pine would split mm. and lime simply doesn't. It's a marvellous wood. Plenty of things suggested themselves to me while I was making it. There's one that I'm working on now. It's not finished, but it's on the way. And it's it's an elaboration of the thing. The uh, the theory being that if you're beginning to eat spaghetti. If you're a you're a, a, a learner spaghetti eater, you better do it in a bath to save the tablecloth. And this one, it's slightly more sophisticated in that he does his chewing on the way up, but he doesn't chew on the way down, which he would do if there weren't two cams. There's an extra cam in here to control the chewing. And also it's geared down. It puts a bit more drama into the thing if you can if you've got a bit of cranking at this end, it just removes the action a little bit from the experience of turning a handle.